as Donald Trump barrels toward making the kind of history we all know he doesn't want to make, being the first American ex-president to ever stand trial criminally. There's some breaking news in the last few minutes on that front. Judge Juan Marchand has just denied a last-ditch delay bid by Trump to derail the hush money trial. It's set to begin in less than two weeks. The ex-president tried to claim one of his favorite hat tricks, presidential immunity, regarding important pieces of evidence in this case. Today, the judge saying, quite frankly, it is too late to litigate the immunity claim. If Trump were to be convicted in this case, uh, what kind of penalty potentially could he be looking at? You know, he could be looking at jail. Oh, that's gonna hurt! Trump's hush money criminal case is set to start jury selection on Monday, April 15th. I know he has four different criminal trials, so it can be a little hard to keep up. The Republican frontrunner everyone. Well, in case you need a refresher on which criminal trial this is, let's break it down. This is a state case. It's being brought by the district attorney for the Southern District of New York, Alvin Bragg. This means that even if Trump were to win the presidency, he could not pardon himself. Presidents can only pardon for federal crimes. Theoretically, the governor of New York could pardon him since it is a New York state crime, but the odds of Democrat governor of New York pardoning him is highly unlikely. This means that if Trump is convicted and sentenced to prison, he'll have to serve it. Um, there, This is one where uh, the judge, I think, is going to be looking at the rule of law to see how other people were treated, other people with a similar uh, criminal background. I think this is a, an area where Donald Trump's pretrial behavior is going to be relevant. Um, if you have someone who's contrite, if you have someone who shares that he's respectful of the rule of law, that this was an aberration, um, that is something that the court can take into account. But if you think that the defendant actually is running basically as an outlaw um, and is basically thumbing his nose at the judicial process and it shows no sign of remorse and essentially is a recidivist, those are factors that a judge can consider. And I am sure that a judge like Judge Mershon, if there were to be a conviction, is going to factor all of that in. But it's, it's just way too soon to say whether it would actually constitute jail time. The one thing I would add, Wolf, is I think the fact that the former president has secret service protection is not going to be something that prevents him from doing jail time. Um, that, that's something that can be worked out. It is a factor, but it is not something that is preclusive, I think, for any judge considering whether to send Donald Trump to jail if there is a conviction. In this case, Trump is charged with 34 counts of falsifying business records. Those charges alone are misdemeanors. But if the prosecution proves that he falsified the business records with the intent of committing another crime, then the charges become felonies, Class E felonies specifically, which is punishable by up to four years in prison. The reason why this particular case is so important is because the reason for the falsification that the other law he wanted to violate had to do with our democracy. The magnet, you just click. I don't even wait. And when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. Whatever you want. Grab them by the <laughs> I can do anything. After the Excess Hollywood tapes came out right before the 2016 election, he didn't want any other bad stories coming out involving affairs or whether or not he had another child nobody knew about. So he made an arrangement with the Inquirer and his lawyer, Michael Cohen, to buy any story like this that he did not want to come out and then have that story buried it. It was called a catch and kill scheme. That is a violation of our election laws because any expense you make during a campaign that helps your campaign, you have to report it. And if you don't report it, it is considered a campaign violation. Senator John Edwards stood trial for a similar thing after he lost his race for presidency. In that trial, it was alleged that money was paid to his mistress during his presidential campaign as a way of keeping her existence outside the public knowledge. And that wasn't reported, according to prosecutors, on his campaign filing forms. In that case, the jury came back with one not guilty and a hung jury on the five other counts. So let's remember that the next time Trump plays the victim and says that this is a special persecution against him, that a Republican prosecutor already came after a former Democratic person running 
for the presidency. And this was years ago. We are now in a universe where we're dealing with some motions that have been filed this week to derail the trial. We've been talking about potentially recusing Judge Mershon, for example. This is a motion that feels like it was filed a lifetime ago, but in actuality was filed on March 7th, just a week after the Supreme Court granted cert or the review of the presidential immunity decision in the case before Judge Chutkin then. Trump then went to Judge Mershon and said, because the Supreme Court is going to consider whether my presidential immunity argument is valid, you should postpone this trial until the Supreme Court can rule on that. And also, you should hold that the state here, meaning the Manhattan DA's office, should not be able to introduce evidence of my official acts that might be evidence in this trial, including, for example, tweets that I sent that they say were efforts to intimidate witnesses in the case, namely Michael Cohen. The judge deciding to Today, Trump's motion was not timely. He said Trump could have filed a motion either to preclude evidence or to save himself from prosecution on presidential immunity grounds at any time and failed to do so until early March. He denied it on that basis alone, but also said he's declining to consider whether or not evidence writ large should be excluded on the basis that that evidence reflects official acts taken by a former president. There's a strong argument for giving Trump prison time if convicted. For one, his lawyer and a Midas Touch host, Michael Cohen, was already sentenced and served time in prison for his role in this catch and kill scheme. Essentially, again, trying to hide bad stories and not reporting that as a campaign contribution. So although that regarding Michael Cohen was a federal charge, and this is a state charge, and they are separate, but they are very related charges because it was based on the same conduct. It seems then more than fair, and we all know how much Trump talks about how he likes things to be fair, that Trump receive a prison sentence similar to Michael Cohen. There are a few factors a judge takes into considering at sentencing. A few will help Trump and a few will hurt him. Is this the defendant's first offense? Is the defendant remorseful? Those are the kind of questions that will come up at sentencing. A sentence is meant to not only punish the defendant for his crime, but also deter him from committing future crimes and also importantly deter the general public from committing that crime. So in his trial, if he's convicted, there will be a separate mini trial only about sentencing and all of these factors will be considered. The prosecution can give their recommendation. The defense will be able to put on witnesses talking about what kind of sentence they think is fair. And then ultimately, the judge will decide. So in this trial, Trump, even if convicted, will be a first time convicted defendant, which will help him in the sentencing here, but incidentally will hurt him in his remaining three trials because he'll no longer be able to claim that he has never been a convicted felon. So the other things that they're going to look at is how remorseful Trump is. So if he is convicted, his inability to show any remorse, his constant misrepresentation of the charges, his nonstop attacks on the judicial system that we have already seen even before the trial has started will make Trump a candidate for a harsher sentence. Again, Trump does receive special treatment, but it's for him, not against him, as we've seen again and again. Because if anyone else but Trump made the comments he has already made before their trial, and I'm sure he'll be keeping going regarding those comments throughout the trial, they would be absolutely sentenced very harshly accordingly. So it is important that the judge or any judge presiding over any of his criminal trials aren't afraid to sentence him like any other defendant. Because that last part, the part about the sentence being a deterrent, is crucial. If people hear him say how meaningless our election laws are, how meaningless the laws are that are against him in this case, how meaningless our fraud laws are, then the effect is for other people to treat them as meaningless as well. And if the judge doesn't take that into account, the laws do lose some of their power because the law is only as important as the power people give it. Will the Secret Service be an issue? Will they give him house arrest instead? If a jury of his peers convicts him, he should just be sentenced to whatever any other defendant would get, not more and not less. You know, if we go back to the 2020 debate, one of the jarring moments was Donald Trump saying, proud boys, stand back and, and stand by. That was a lot of people remembered that moment. You know, now Donald Trump gives these rallies, the first event he held of the campaign season, 
was in Waco, Texas. But he starts all of these events with the uh, January 6th anthem. He's taken our national anthem. He's changed the words, and he now sings the song with the January 6th rioters who are in the D.C. jail, some of the most violent of the insurrectionists who he calls to free, and he calls them hostages. How odd, how weird, how how dangerous is, is that rhetoric? And w- what do you make of that? Well, I, I think it shows Trump believes that he can win simply by mobilizing what he sees as his base. And and I think I think the conduct that he displayed on January the 6th uh, all day long, basically, uh, alone disqualifies him to be president. Uh, there, there, none of these people were in the Capitol on any legitimate business. And, and my own view as a, as, a, uh, as a law and order conservative is they all ought to be in jail for a very long period of time. Uh, I, I think January the 6th wasn't the worst of it, though. I think later when he said the Constitution itself should be suspended so that he could be declared the winner of the 2020 election. I mean, you're really in fantasy land at this point. But he talked about suspending the Constitution like you would think uh, the ruler of a banana republic would say it. That is disqualifying. And uh, it's uh, it's obviously disturbing that that uh, that that people don't uh, more widely see it that way, that they say, well, it's just Trump being Trump. Uh, and, and that's the danger. When he says these things, he's, he's actually saying things he believes in. And it sometimes takes him a while. He talks about it and talks about it and talks about it. But then you find that uh, he he then actually acts on these things. Regardless of the sentence, the judge decides to give him, we know based on the polling, that if Trump is even just convicted of any of these charges, he will lose a lot of votes. Elections are always one in the margin. Essentially, how many swing voters can you turn your way? How many of your base can you motivate to get out and vote? It turns out when you've been convicted, voters don't feel as motivated to vote for you. The end of the day, most voters want some sort of functional government. A convicted president is just not a good look. Love this video? Make sure you stay up to date on the latest breaking news and all things Midas by signing up to the Midas Touch newsletter at MidasTouch.com slash newsletter.